Hey everyone, David C. Anderson here coming at you from the Knife Center and welcome to Knife AQ number 40, the knife series where I answer all your questions, whether they're sharp or dull. This week we're talking about butterfly knives for EDC, different blade grinds, and just how many knives should a person carry every day, and a whole lot more. Let's get into it. All right, everyone, thank you for all your questions as always. If you would like to have a chance to have one of your questions featured, as always, just leave it down below in the comments section. Thanks for watching our Blade Show Week uh, special last, uh, last weekend as well. On that note, there was one question I forgot to include in that special, and it was a good one. Uh, from Mr. Jean Bordonco, nice uh, repeat commenter for us. So before we get into the non-Blade Show stuff, I want to bring that question back in. Uh, he asks, if there's a chance, I'd really like you to ask some knife makers and designers, what is the knife that pushed them into the industry? Was it the first knife they got or just something iconic like a Sabenza? Very cool. Uh, so I thought it was a great question. We didn't have time to ask too many folks about it, but I did ask my friends, uh, Mr. LT Wright and Dan Eastland of Dogwood Custom Knives this question and we uh, filmed their responses. So uh, Thomas, this is where you'll put in those videos. Is it? It is. Okay. Check these guys out. Probably when I was a kid, my dad had a Herder's catalog knife. If, you ever, if you've ever heard of Herder's catalog, which was very Kephart in design and it was like a it was like a butcher knife, but it was a hunting knife. And I really, really liked that herder's design. It was simple. It was a 10 series, 1095 or something. Extremely thin, like a 332nd. And man, as a kid, I used to play in, in the woods, you know, pretending you were Tarzan, and I had this herder's knife. So I would have to say that's the one that really, really got me started going down the knife making thing. Uh, and then my dad was always a buck knife guy. So I loved the Buck 124, and for one Christmas I got the Buck 124. If you're familiar with it, it's a long Bowie style knife. And I used to love, I'd carry that around everywhere. And then naturally the Buck 110, uh, big fan of that. So those are, that would, I would have to say is my starting point. Uh, it, was a, it was a classic Bowie knife that I made with Mark Hopper. Um, we had been working on a project when I was a woodworker. And he finally just said, hey man, come in on Saturday, I'll show you how to make a knife. And it was a, a very traditional American Bowie, brass guard, and, and that was it. I mean, it was ray of sunshine on the anvil, choir of angels singing. I came home and told my wife I'm going to be a knife maker. And I came back to that knife maybe five or six years after I had been a stable, successful knife maker. And that led me to the Aquila, which was this whole re-innovation, getting back to that first knife I ever made. And now it's kind of fun to see that, that first knife and then see the progress and how it's influenced me over different patterns that wound up with the Aquila. Um, so yeah, I'm just a traditional Bowie knife kind of guy. All right, next question comes from GK Junior 2564 uh, Hey DCA, can you explain the difference between a saber grind and a high flat grind? And maybe show some examples of each. I'm a visual learner. Thanks. <clears throat> sure thing. So this is one of those terms, saber grind gets thrown around a lot. And unfortunately, there's no hard and fast actual definition. Um, but I'll, I'll kind of get into uh, kind of historically what it typically would mean, at least as far as I understood it. I'm not the, uh, the foremost expert on this, believe me, is the saber grind would be ground halfway up the blade. So it wouldn't be like a full flat grind. It also wouldn't be something like a Scandi grind. That's something completely different. But essentially you'd have a blade ground at least halfway up the blade. Nowadays, it's kind of meant to mean anything that's maybe at least halfway or even higher is often referred to as a saber grind. The reason I, I don't always like this too much is it doesn't actually tell you what the geometry of the grind is because a saber grind could be flat could be hollow, could even be convex. But most people these days, and LT Wright specifically, I'm showing this Gen 5 here as an example, when they say saber grind, they mean a partial height flat grind. But again, like actual definitionally, historically, it could be any grind. So I always like to get a little more specific. I'll say it's a saber flat or a saber hollow when I'm describing an edge. Uh, but when it does come to the LT Wrights, your sabers will be flat. And if they call it a flat grind, it's going to be a full flat grind. Sometimes they, they might leave a little bit, it might be a nearly full flat grind in any case. So hope that clears things up a little bit. 
even though it's not a, uh, I can't give you a, a hard, uh, hard and fast definition, a clear line in the sand on that, but that's kind of what they're talking about. Next question comes from Drew Ryan. He says, I have a Buck 110 Hunter, classic knife, from 1999, but I haven't carried it for quite a while and I stored it in the sheath. When I got it out the other day, the bolsters and part of the liner had tarnished and has some green on it. What's the best way to restore it to that sweet polished look? Also, what's the best way to store this blade so that it doesn't tarnish? Uh, obviously, brass, of course, is, uh, is what you're talking about. It will get that kind of green color, which can get kind of gunky after a while. Um, best way to clean that up um, depends on how far gone it is. Uh, some barkeeper's friend might be, it might be a good place to start. And then you're going to want to polish from there. A uh, good at-home solution could be something like a, a Dremel with a little polishing wheel on it that can bring some of the shine back to it. You may have gotten a little pitting underneath that green, however, so you know your mileage may vary on that. In terms of keeping it from happening in the future, number one thing you're going to want to do is not store it in the sheath, especially if it's a leather sheath like the 110s uh, still come with today. Because any, any place where the sheath is in contact with the brass, it's that much more likely to develop kind of that, that nasty stuff. Uh, other things you can do, give it a, a light wipe down with something like mineral oil or something like uh, the Century Solutions Tough Cloth. These are really nice. There's some, uh, some inhibitors built into these when you wipe them down, can be very nice. Uh, if you wanna go even further, you can store it uh, with a little desiccant pack, you know, like you get them in the electronics, a little pack says, do not eat this, throw them in there. Um, they're not going to last forever, obviously, but you can kind of keep refreshing them as you get new stuff. They even sell uh, ones out there that you can recharge like in the microwave or by plugging into the, uh, the outlet. So you could store stuff like this maybe in a small box and that would help keep them dry as well. Or you could just carry them. Or you just, you just carry them, hashtag use your stuff. Sure. There's a lot of, if this guy's any, anything like me, there's a lot of knives in our collection. So you can't always use all of them. Fair. Yeah. At least I got a fair from Thomas. That's nice. Uh, next question is from Dustin E. Uh, hey DCA, I recently, that's funny. Hey DCA, I recently bought a knife online and hated it the second I opened it. Uh, it just seemed cheaply made, didn't feel great, and I regretted buying it. However, after some regular use, I realized it was fun to fidget with and it gets the job done nicely in most cases, and it's now one of my favorite knives. Have you ever had a knife you hated at first but ended up loving? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I'm actually going to give it to a whole category of, of not a uh, not a cheaply made knife by any stretch of the imagination, but Spyderco's compression lock. I used to really almost aggressively not care for this particular lock, um, especially back in the day when I when I first experienced it. I was all about crossbar locks. So if it, if it wasn't a Benchmade with my Axis lock, I thought this was just trying to be what the Benchmade was, but it wasn't as ambidextrous. I've, I've turned around a little bit. I've since, uh, since come around to this lock and uh, it has its own charms for sure. And if you're right-handed and you're not worried about the left-handed ability, at least you're not gonna have to uh, worry about an Omega spring in those uh, crossbar locks potentially breaking. I've only had that happen once to me over the years, but you get a lot of nice flick open action with the compression lock. You can do things that I like about the crossbar lock, like keeping your fingers out of the path of the blade as you go along or as you unlock the knife and close it, I should say. So that's it for me. I've, I've definitely come around a lot to the compression lock and you might find a, a pair of three in my pocket these days kind of often. So hope that answers your question, sir. Next one, Michael Hurt asks, so how many knives should a rational person carry on them? Totally asking for a friend. Sure, yeah, well tell your friend. Um, depends on your needs, honestly. Uh, myself, I usually carry two. I'll have a primary folder, like potentially a pair of three. And I always have as my backup, a Swiss Army knife. And 99 times out of 100, it's my Winger, or sorry, I used to carry the Winger version, but it's the Victorinox Evo Grip S18. Has everything I need it uh, day to day, and then a little bit some on top of that. It's even got a nice locking blade there. And the reason I like to carry this as the, uh, as the complement is, I've always said like a Swiss army knife is just way too useful not to have, but obviously the steel is not going to be up to spec of something like this Maximet Para 3, for example. But this is something that if I want to be a little less circumspect in, uh, in cutting something, I can take this out. If somebody's asking to borrow a knife to cut something, I'll feel a lot better handing them this versus a, uh, a much more expensive knife that they might 
do something stupid with. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, that's the answer for me. Uh, Thomas over there, I know, carries three day to day. You got your Skeletool, Bug Out, the, and the ZT55. All in his pocket at the same time, or no, two in a pocket, Leatherman on the belt. Yeah. But uh, you did say rational person. I don't, I don't know if I'm the right one to ask there. Yeah, but then again, I usually have a Leatherman wave in my uh, in my backpack every day too. That goes most places I do. That counts as a carry. Now I'm just wondering if I'm a rational person. I think we're both lost. There. Or or an irrational person. Yeah. We're knife people. You might not want to ask us this question. <laughs> Two is a good place to start. We'll go with that. Why not? John Smith asks, aside from its stability, what is are the practical advantage is of balisongs compared with other folding knives? Uh, I like this question because you're, it seems you're coming from a place of someone who's thinking about carrying and using a bally as an actual EDC rather than just as something that's fun to play with. Um, so there are, there are a few reasons you might want to carry a bally if you are able to where you live, of course, is one, oftentimes you can get a lot of blade length into a fairly compact handle compared to some of the other you know, let's be honest, overbuilt knives these days. There are other options, you know, this uh, this Endura from Spyderco actually managed to have a pretty slim handle, but the Bally is gonna fold up nice and compact so you can carry a lot of blade without taking up too much room in the pocket. And especially if you have one like this particular Emerson right here with the, uh, the pocket clip on there, be able to carry it just like any other normal thing too. Uh, other advantages, especially ones with the latch like this, it's not likely to come open in your pocket and, and potentially cut you accidentally that way. And also, you know, you did mention stability and that's a, that's a big draw of it. In the open position, you've got two pivots here. And if one pivot were to break, it's still not likely that this blade is going to close towards your fingers. So a lot of good things to like about a Bally. And yeah, I mean, you can even get them with a little finger guard on on this guy if you if you pick the right design. So I would love to see more people EDC a, uh, a Balasong actually. Sometimes when I talk about it in that respect, people kind of give me the side eye, but I think it's a good idea and I would encourage you, sir. All right, next question, William Cook the Third He says, I got a friend who works with a lot of rope and paracord. What super steel blade would have the longest lasting edge under $150? Uh, easy answer right now at this point in time, Spyderco's lightweight series with K390 blades are going to be spot on. Uh, the Endura is comes in about 133. This is kind of the most blade you can get in this series for under 150. The police model is a, a little bit bigger, but is I think 160 something these days. But because you're dealing with a, a more inexpensive handle like the injection molded here, you're able to spend more of that budget on the blade steel itself. And this K390 is going to last an extremely long time. Uh, you know, the, the corrosion or sorry, the abrasion resistance you get from something like this is going to work very well on rope. You can even get it in a fully serrated edge, which for this person who works with a lot of rope and paracord might be even better uh, for them. And they're, you know, it's about the same price, if not the same price for the serrated version. So definitely I would check these guys out. All right. Now we come to our lightning round for today. First question from Nathan Olmstead. Uh, for someone, if someone were filming a science fiction short film on a budget, what would you suggest for a futuristic looking knife that is cheap and wouldn't be ru ruined by dulling the edge for safety on set? I would go with, actually there's several Kershaws you could go with, but I would go with the Parsec. Really cool look going on, definitely has kind of a futuristic vibe, comes in about 42 bucks. You know, got an 8CR series stainless, so you know you wouldn't feel bad about dulling the knife blade a little bit. And bonus, Parsec is a, a unit of measure in space, so that's kind of cool too. Uh, the Lightyear also is another knife they make, but I don't think that one will look very good on cam look as good on camera, I should say. Check out that Parsec. All right, no likes to year S says I work in kitchens and something that never happened before recently occurred. The spine of a knife was so raw that it snagged my fingers while chopping. The question is, how can I dull the spine of the knife with home tools? Weird question, maybe, thanks for the vids. You're welcome, sir. Um, so un unlike something like a bushcraft knife like this Gen 5, where you want that crisp spine for doing things like stri striking a fire steel, on a kitchen knife, I could definitely see how that would get to be a little annoying. Uh, depends on how dull it or how sharp it is. 
hate to say you, like, you might want to take it to stones, but I would try starting with some really fine grit, wet, dry sandpaper, maybe 800 or 1200 to start with and just kind of run the edge lightly on it and see if you can't just kind of knock that sharpness off of there. All right, Brian asks, hi, Dave, how do you or can you sharpen ceramic blades? Thanks. Uh, one can, but it's kind of difficult. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a job to do. Honestly, ceramic knives are almost, at least I usually consider them to be almost disposable items because they, they tend to be very sharp and can hold an edge a long time, but they're not that tough and can chip really easily. So if you've got a really big chip out of the edge, honestly, I'd just chuck it. But if it's not too bad, go with something that has diamond plates on it, fine grit and go really carefully, not a lot of pressure at all almost no pressure at all, I'd say. And that might be able to, uh, you know, various grits of that might be able to get you back to something that's usable. All right, next question is from Live Free or Die. Maybe someone from New Hampshire, perhaps. Uh, can you discuss why pocket clips are so popular? Because they're convenient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they keep your, your pockets organized, you know, the knife's not falling about. Um, ever since Spyderco put a clip on a pocket knife, it's been all the rage. So a lot of people tend to agree. Uh, but on to the second part of your question, uh, with my pocket clip, I have scratched paint and lost my knife whilst pushing through the brush, not to mention they cause handle hot spots. Um, obviously, yeah, if you do have a clip, there is the potential for it to get snagged. If you, you know, you're kind of going to run into that into the bush. Uh, most of the time, it's why I usually like to wear a fixed blade myself with a, a secure sheath system, but to avoid potentially the scratched paint or the handle discomfort, Look for something with a wire pocket clip like this Becker BK40, which is a very inexpensive knife. It's about 40 bucks. So this is one, if you did lose it in the brush while it was pocket clipped, wouldn't tear your heart out quite as much. Uh, but a lot of spider Co's use these, uh, several Italian makers use these on a number of their models, but you've got all round edges. So you don't have any sharper spots. And like I said, be a little more comfortable and less likely to cause those scratches. All right, next question comes from Istvan Toth. What's that hole for on the Condor machetes? Could someone explain? Sure, I've got the, uh, the Polar North here. This hole out here near the tip is what you're referring to. Uh, honestly, they do this mostly for aesthetics. They call that the Eye of the Condor. It's kind of, a, kind of a signature brand element for them. However, you do get the advantage of being able to hang it from a peg or a nail or something like that might not come in uh, to or come into play too much at camp, although it could. Uh, but if you wanted to have this, let's say in your garage or in a tool shed, be real handy to keep it hung up on a pegboard or something like that. But mostly aesthetic. Which brings us to our final comment, our most serious question of the day from Cucamonga says, I wouldn't use the paracord on my knife handle for a survival situation. That's what my paracord belt is for and my paracord neck knife lanyard and paracord sock garter for my boot knife. Plus those knives also have paracord handles as well as my paracord suspenders because paracord belts are awful. I can't argue with that. It's not a question, but I love this comment so much. I, I just enjoyed the heck out of it. And he, it's so good. You got the turnaround there at the end with the belt, bringing the belt back and he's making fun of all of us, like having a laugh for you know, carrying so many things and EDC lifestyle. I love it. Fantastic. You're saying three knives might be a little too many. So how many has he got here? Uh, one, two, he's got three. Okay. He sounds reasonable. I think we're good. If you want a chance to get one of your own questions featured in the future, just leave them down below in the comments and to check out these knives and pick one up for yourself, we'll leave links in the description to take you over to knifecenter.com. While you're over there, make sure you sign up for our Knife Rewards program, because if you're going to buy one of these knives today, you might as well earn some free money to spend on your next one. I'm David C. Anderson from the Knife Center, signing off. See you next time.